Beijing allows two American siblings to leave China and come home after three years. Their father is one of China's most wanted corrupt officials. Beijing accuses him of committing major bank fraud. Power shortages cause issues across China, and American businesses are feeling the pain. Coal shortages may play a role, but some say the real cause is the Chinese Communist Party's global ambition. A China affairs analyst breaks it down. America is spending big bucks to kick Huawei out of U.S. networks. One government agency is now lending a hand to rural telecom carriers. Heavy rains drench northern China. The continued downpours have already caused flooding and mudslides. And China's real estate industry seems to be booming, but many buildings are being ripped down. We look at what's behind it. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Before we start with our daily news, we have a short announcement. We have our premiere at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time from Monday to Saturday on our YouTube channel and also on TV. NTD is available on many platforms, including cable TV, satellite, and over-the-air TV across the U.S., and it continues to grow. Please check out ntd.com slash TV. Type in your zip code to find all the ways you can watch our show. That's ntd.com slash TV. And Chinese authorities allowed two American siblings to return home last weekend. That's after they've been barred from leaving China for more than three years. Their release comes after a deal between the U.S. Justice Department and a high-profile Chinese businesswoman. The woman is Meng Wanzhou, an executive at China's telecom giant Huawei. The DOJ earlier accused her of committing bank fraud, and Meng has been under house arrest in Canada. The U.S. allowed her to return to China last week after Meng admitted some wrongdoings. As for the American siblings, Chinese police never charged them, but their father is one of Beijing's most wanted fugitives. The father, Liu Changming, was a former bank executive. Authorities accuse him of implementing one of China's biggest bank frauds, involving over $1 billion. He had become one of China's so-called naked officials. That refers to officials that send their wives and children overseas to Western countries, in most cases, the U.S. Their children then go on to attend the best schools there, while the officials stay in China alone and earn money to support the family abroad. Family Liu owns a number of U.S. assets, partly in real estate. One of them is valued at more than $2 million. Other properties include a high-end apartment in New York. Public records give no indication that these assets were bought using Liu's money, obtained from bribes inside China. The two siblings attended expensive private schools and later top U.S. colleges like Harvard Business School. Liu fled China in 2007. The siblings had explained Beijing's tactic in the past, keeping Liu's children hostage in China in order to force him to return. During the siblings' three years in China, they were allowed to move around freely in the country but were barred from leaving. The U.S. is shelling out big money to kick Huawei out of America's telecom network. Huawei is a Chinese tech giant, and it's also a top telecom equipment maker. But Washington says the company is a Trojan horse that spies for Beijing and has warned allies not to use Huawei's equipment. The U.S. also has its eyes on another Chinese tech giant, ZTE. Last year, the U.S. designated these two companies as national security threats to communication networks. But the problem is, removing their equipment from networks could cost a lot of money, over $1 billion. The high cost proves challenging for rural telecom carriers. So the body that regulates American telecom networks, the Federal Communications Commission, is lending a hand. It has set aside almost $2 billion to help rural telecom carriers replace the Chinese equipment. The reimbursement program will open this October, and carriers have until next January to apply. Chinese telecom giant Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou returned to China on Saturday. This after being under house arrest in Canada amid a three-year battle against extradition to the U.S. The reason behind her release comes down to a deal she made, not with Canada, but with the U.S. It's an agreement that she signed admitting to wrongdoing, saying that she knowingly deceived a bank. The Wall Street Journal reported on how the deal could have come about. The U.S. Justice Department had insisted that any resolution would require Meng to admit wrongdoing. And as the case dragged on, Meng eventually agreed. 
She acknowledged that she made untrue statements to a bank that led the institution to provide services that violated U.S. sanctions on Iran. DOJ officials said that they made the deal because they expect that Mo would continue appeals related to her extradition that could prolong the case for several years, per the Wall Street Journal. Department officials say that the deal was 85 percent of what they were ultimately seeking. European plane manufacturer Airbus wants more business with China and negotiated with China over the potential certification of its commercial airplanes. The certification could boost Airbus sales in China. NTD's Don Ma has more. Airbus, U.S. plane manufacturer Boeing's biggest competitor, is in talks with China about certifying one of its single-aisle airliners. Once certified, the aircraft will be cleared for service in China. It could boost sales for Airbus in the large Chinese aviation market. Chinese plane maker, Commercial Aircraft Corporation of China, or COMAC, says Chinese flight demand is expected to increase over the next two decades. This means China needs to either manufacture more or buy more planes. Airbus is a European aerospace product manufacturer. On Tuesday, the CEO of Airbus's China business said that talks were already underway for the single-aisle A220 commercial airplane. We have already started the certification process for this aircraft in China. Our engine manufacturer has been working together with the Civil Aviation Authority of China and working closely to obtain a test certificate for this aircraft. Mr. Xi made the comment at China's biggest air show. It's called China International Aviation and Aerospace Exhibition. It kicked off in southern China's Guangdong province on Tuesday. It's usually held once every two years. Foreign commercial plane makers also attended the show, including U.S. plane maker Boeing. Canada also attended. The Canadian Consul General in China downplayed the impact of the case of Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou. He said he would like to see more business between Canada and China. Uh, that being said, uh, as you know, uh, just in the last few days, uh, there's been some uh, positive developments uh, between Canada and China. Uh, and I hope that uh, we can build on those positive developments in order to kind of uh, do even more business uh, in ways that benefit both countries. At the exhibition, China also showed off its military air prowess. It paraded some of the country's most cutting-edge military planes, including surveillance drones, fighter planes and stealth jets. Don Ma, NTD News. If you're in the market for some electronics, you might have to wait. Power shortages across China have caused numbers of factories to halt production. A China affairs analyst explains the reasons behind the blackouts. It's bad news for the peak season of electronics goods. Several Chinese factories are shutting down production, sending shockwaves through global suppliers. The reason? Power restrictions. I've never heard this before. It's kind of crazy. Carissa Ruby is the founder of a camera manufacturer, Dakota Micro, one of the many American businesses impacted by the cuts. But the hardest hit is China itself. From aluminum smelters to textiles producers, factories are being ordered to curb activity or shut altogether. Some shops have to operate by candlelight, and traffic lights are out too. That's what's happened across 20 of China's 34 provinces and regions. Last year, China banned imports of Australian coal. The country supplied about 60 percent of China's thermal coal in 2019. China affairs analyst Tong Jingyuan says Chinese authorities blame the current power cuts on surging coal prices, but adds that's not the real reason. So the lack of electricity because of coal shortages is really just a trigger. The real reason behind them is the Chinese Communist Party used that trigger, then purposely added a kind of executive order to get rid of what it thinks is excess capacity or low-end industries. For decades, China has been regarded as the world's factory, producing goods for the world's wealthy consumer countries. And the U.S. is its biggest consumer. But now, Tong says, Beijing wants more. The party wants to develop the kind of industry that enriches mid- to high-end manufacturing entities, which it sees as the party's biggest asset in its long-term strategic competition with the United States. In recent years, China has seen new infrastructure development, including 5G network construction, artificial intelligence and data centers. They're included in Beijing's future development plan. The big data and digital surveillance industry has helped Beijing collect mass data and information on Chinese citizens. And now it's competing with other sectors and even residents for power. The smaller companies and the individuals and even all the way down to households, they kind of get sacrificed. According to China's official report, 
It says one ton of coal. If you put that into the big data industry, it can directly generate 10,000 yuan worth of output value for the data center and 880,000 yuan for the digital economy. This added value will also drive the whole digital industrial chain, about 3.6 million yuan. But in recent months, post-pandemic recovery has caused a surge in demand for goods globally. This power cut, you can see the most prominent feature is precisely happening in provinces that dominate China's manufacturing industry, such as Zhejiang, Jiangsu and Guangdong. They are the big manufacturing provinces. In these areas, power reductions and outages are particularly prominent. Many of these large orders get placed with China. As a result, numbers of low-end, high-energy consumption manufacturing companies in China increased, and they need a lot of electricity. But why doesn't Beijing just increase electricity prices? Tong says that's because the price is directly related to people's livelihoods. If that's affected on a large scale, it may cause some so-called stability issues for Beijing, either societal or political. Evergrande's building what might be the biggest soccer stadium in the world. But now that it's facing so much debt, many worry if the company can finish the $2 billion project. Meanwhile, Evergrande says the project is proceeding as normal. Drone footage reveals that Evergrande's half-built football club stadium, the Guangzhou FC Soccer Stadium, doesn't appear to have many workers on site. The project was set to cost around $2 billion and is scheduled to be completed next year. Real estate giant China's Evergrande rattled global markets last week when it defaulted on a bond payment. It's currently over $300 billion in debt and has run short on cash. Considering its massive debt headaches, many are voicing concerns about the future of the project. But the company told Reuters Monday that work on the stadium is proceeding as normal. Some locals say they're not buying it. One of them explained there used to be hundreds of workers present at the construction site, Named Lou, the man described going to the half-built stadium in an effort to find out what's going on. I'm worried they'll stop working and then leave. Evergrande announced last year that once complete, the stadium will seat over 100,000 spectators. That puts it on track to becoming one of the world's largest soccer stadiums. The Guangzhou Football Club was previously named Guangzhou Evergrande Football Club. It's part of the Chinese Super League and boasts lots of athlete star power with names like former World Cup winner Fabio Canavero. In September, heavy rains hit northern China. Rainfall this year is more than double that of average years. And at the same time, high temperatures and droughts hit the southern part of the country. In northern China's Henan province, a river's water levels rose after heavy rain. Then the authorities discharged flood water from a nearby reservoir without any warnings. Over the weekend, a building on the riverbank was seen collapsing. The number of casualties is unknown. For days, at least two cities in the province have been submerged in water. Roads turned to rivers, with cars floating in it. In Nia County, residents were seen standing on the second floor of their homes, waiting for rescue. Roads are destroyed, and heavy rains triggered mudslides in southwestern China's Sichuan province. The landslide in Ya'an City submerged a hydropower station's reservoir area, trapping 17 construction workers. Among them, seven were killed and seven are still missing as of Monday. The landslides interrupted a local traffic and cut off communication signals. The city issued a level two flood control emergency response on Sunday. This is the second highest grading in a four-tier scale. In northwest China's Sanxi province, heavy rainfall is drenching some parts of the province. Local authorities said that in the southern part of the province, in the past 10 days, rainfall was two to three times higher than usual. Chinese property seemed to be booming, but then construction would often suddenly stop, even for years, and eventually return to rubble. This type of abandoned construction site is common in China. There's even a name for it in Chinese, Lanwei Lo, meaning a rotten tall building. They're often demolished or taken over by new developers. That's because of China's aggressive urban development model. To boost economic growth, the local governments sell land and launch massive infrastructure projects. Developers tend to sell apartments years before construction is finished and use the money to fund the construction. But when demand drops due to slowing economic growth and there's an oversupply of land, they struggle to find buyers and cash to finish their projects. 
In Kunming City, where 15 high-rise buildings were demolished last month, local authorities counted 93 unfinished property projects there. Real estate means everything in China, and buyers often take on heavy debts themselves to buy these apartments. Some of them were forced to move into these unfinished buildings as they continue to pay mortgages. In one unfinished complex in Kuming, some homeowners had been living without water and electricity. They used solar power generators and candles. One resident climbed the stairs to his 18th floor apartment every day. But Beijing is now putting more restrictions on how much developers can borrow. More than a thousand robots are set to join the delivery personnel ranks of Chinese giants Alibaba, Meituan, and JD.com over the next year. It comes as the pandemic fueled demand for contactless services. With the push of a button and scan of a receipt, self-driving robots are ready to roam the streets of Beijing. Chinese tech giants like Alibaba and JD.com are set to add over a thousand robots to their ranks over the next year as the demand for contactless delivery surges. And as labor costs rise and the costs of automation go down, JD.com's chief scientist, Kong Chi, says the robots benefit their delivery workers too. Our delivery men seem happy when they use the self-driving vehicles. For example, in the city of Changshu, we had a delivery guy using three self-driving vehicles to help him deliver and collect parcels. And he had to do more customer service on the side, so his salary increased proportionately by quite a bit. Kong says the global health crisis accelerated JD.com's shift to automated deliveries, which researchers at the University of Michigan say could cut delivery costs by up to 40 percent. But with just a few compartments for delivery, some customers say the robots still aren't as efficient as their human colleagues. I think that when it comes to making deliveries to offices, its level of efficiency is low. People are ordering a large amount of food and goods. But as you can see with this robot, its delivery capacity is quite small. JD.com, Alibaba and fellow e-commerce giant Meituan expect to be operating over 2,000 delivery robots by the end of next year. Locals in Philadelphia are showing their support for a grassroots movement that has taken hold in China. It started over a decade ago and involves hundreds of millions of Chinese people. So how does it impact us here today? Some residents in Philadelphia held a rally on Sunday to celebrate a grassroots movement, quitting the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. It's a major movement. Over 300 million Chinese people have renounced their membership with the CCP and its affiliated organizations. The movement started over 17 years ago, and it has picked up steam among Chinese people both in and outside China. And an organization in the U.S. has been helping them out. It's called the Global Service Center for Quitting the CCP. Those who wish to drop their party membership would post a statement on the center's website. And many people, especially those inside China, choose to post the statement under a pseudonym for safety reasons. Here's a snapshot of why they chose to quit the party. A resident from northern China talked about the regime's surveillance. He says it's very depressing to live under the regime's surveillance. Authorities are monitoring citizens with modern technology, and citizens can't freely express what they really think about society and politics. It's like living inside a big prison every day, and it's suffocating. Another person touched on the CCP's persecution. In the statement, she wrote, Three seniors in my family were persecuted to death during the regime's cultural revolution. The Chinese Communist Party is bandits, and party officials are super corrupt. I really hate this organization. Former party leader Mao Zedong launched the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s. Many Western scholars say over half a million people have died from this movement. And back in Pennsylvania, the state house there has issued a citation celebrating the rally. It says those who are no longer affiliated with the party and understand the values of democratic ideals will not assist the CCP in its subversion and infiltration activities, thereby lessening the threat the CCP poses to the international community. A state senator says he came to the event because he wanted to support the freedom of expression. And certainly we believe that all people should, uh, in all countries, including China, should have the freedom of expression. Uh, Certainly something in the United States we have. uh, We want that for people across the world. 
He added that the regime's persecution of Uyghur Muslims and the Hong Kong people shouldn't have happened, and that he is urging the Chinese regime to stop the human rights abuses in China. China strongly condemned the U.K. on Monday after the country sailed one of its warships through the Taiwan Strait. Beijing said this behavior harbored evil intentions. But the spokesperson for the British Ministry of Defense says the warship is navigating the Taiwan Strait in accordance with international law. British Royal Navy warship HMS Richmond posted on Twitter, after a busy period working with partners and allies in the East China Sea, we're now en route through the Taiwan Strait to visit Vietnam and the Vietnam People's Navy. The Taiwan Strait is a narrow waterway separating Taiwan and mainland China. China claims Taiwan as its own territory, as well as much of the nearby South China Sea. For years, Beijing has been intensifying its presence in the Taiwan Strait by sending more aircraft to areas close to the island. In the first nine months of this year, Beijing's aircraft entered Taiwan's air defense identification zone over 500 times. That's three times more than for the same period last year. HMS Richmond is one of the warships, along with the HMS Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier, seen here, that make up the UK carrier strike group, currently deployed to the Indo-Pacific. According to the South Korean Defense Ministry, North Korea has launched what's believed to be a short-range ballistic missile. The missile landed off the east coast of the Korean peninsula. It was fired around 6.40 a.m. local time today, according to South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff. South Korea's defense ministry calls the missile launch regrettable. Japanese state media reported the projectile appears to have landed outside Japan's exclusive economic zone. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.